take out your bulletins. What's the title of this sermon today? T-D-O-G. 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 You know what that stands for? T-D-O-G. Total Dependence on God. Easy way for you to understand it, right? But it is how we, especially as Christians, should live. Total dependence on God. If you look and see where we're at in the history of this world, we need to have total dependence on God. Either the world is going to consume us and overwhelm us, or we, through the power of Jesus Christ, are going to overcome the world. And the choice is yours. Jesus said, do not be afraid, because he has overcome the world. Is that right? Amen. Now, did he overcome the world just for himself? Or did he do it as an example for us? So in Christ, do you have any power at all? In Christ, is there power to overcome? Is there power to overcome the world? The question is, what is the world? Right? The world is anything and everything that's not in and of Christ. Right? So Christ has given you power to overcome everything and anything that's not of Him. I want you to think about that. Because the next thing you have to ask yourself is, is that a true statement or is it false? And if it's a true statement, then the next question is, is are you having victory in your life? So, T, D, O, G, total dependence on God. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus overcome the world through his own power? Or did he have to depend on somebody? Who did Jesus depend on? Okay? So if Jesus had to depend on his Father to overcome, then why do we go through this life thinking we're going to do it on our own? Alright, what I want you to do is if you brought a pen and some paper, I want you to write these scriptures down. If you didn't bring a pen and paper, the bulletin has a blank space in the back specifically for this, and there's pens or pencils in the back of each pew. That's what they're there for. It's not just to put your tie in below and write this up. Right. So write these scriptures down. Let's look at it. Uh, the first one is what Ray read. Turn to Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. <coughs> what does Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 say? The first word is what? Trust. Trust. Ray, do you have that? Yeah. Do you want to read it again? Because you did so well. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Stop. So. That was good, bro. You just cut that right off, man. God expects you to trust Him with how much of your heart? Oh. Listen, this is why Christianity today is so weak and so feeble. Because God wants all of us, but we only want to give God part of us. Okay? God says, you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Right? And so, Ray just read, trust in the Lord with all your heart. What happens is, is we trust God with our hearts as long as things are going our way. But the first time adversity comes, and really bad adversity, then we wonder how we're going to get through this. And our minds aren't on God, it's on how we're going to get through this. So, the question is, is how do we trust God with all of our hearts, when you're laying on your deathbed. Because that's where Janet is right now. Amen. Now we can look and say, well, you know, Janet has lived a full life. And this is a normal part of life. If you live and Jesus doesn't come back, guess what? You're all going to die, right? Now here's another thing. 
Let's take Aaliyah Davis. This poor child has been in the hospital since the summertime. She's gone through four open heart surgeries. Four of them in a six month period of time. Ten years old. Each one hoping to get her better, each one not doing what it was supposed to do. The last operation to give her a brand new heart. Now you as parents think, what would that be like for you as you watch your child go through this? And you, as ministers of the gospel, have to stay faithful to Jesus Christ. So you either learn to trust the Lord with all of your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, what? Acknowledge Him. And what does He promise to do? He will direct your path. Why does God allow a 10-year-old to go through so much suffering? Why does God allow a parent of that 10-year-old to experience so much wrenching heartache? Ooh, you guys got quiet. You either have to face these questions head on, or you're going to stick your head in the sand and hope that these things don't come your way. But guess what? They will. You walk with Jesus Christ, if you're faithful to Him, you will experience pain, you will experience suffering, you will experience sorrow. But you know what? You're not alone, because even those who don't believe in Christ will do the same thing. The difference is, is do you want your suffering to be for a purpose, or to be for nothing? Because that's what God does with your suffering. God allows it to happen for your good. Sometimes that's hard to see, but, but, think about this. Those of you who are parents, those of you who have raised your child, or those of you who are in the midst of raising your children, if you gave your child everything that child asked for, whenever it asked for it, would you be a good parent? Would you be doing what's really in that child's best interest? No. Why? Because see, this is what I see parenting has gone to today. Is that they give their children whatever they want, whenever they want, and now you have a whole generation of bratty kids. What's the difference between God dealing with us as His children? Now you can be 90-some years old, are you still a child to God? Yes. So God is merciful and God is just and God is right by not giving us everything we ask for. If in our sinful condition God made our lives a smooth road, a bed of roses with no pain, we would want to stay sinners for the rest of our lives. Right? Yes. Because we wouldn't want anything else. So God allows pain, disease, suffering to come to show us that this wasn't His plan to begin with. That there's so much more that He has in store for us if we have total dependence on Him. I always think of 1 Corinthians 10 13. What does that say? When you ask, uh, why does God give so, uh, some people so much to deal with? It says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Amen. I guess the closer you are to God, the more you are tested. Yes. Listen, didn't Jesus promise that? <laughs> didn't He actually promise that? He promised you that if you're going to be faithful to Him, you will suffer persecution and temptations and trials. Here's the question. If you're not having any type of problems, and you're not suffering any type of persecution or trials, 
you might want to check and see just what your relationship with Jesus is. Ellen White wrote that the reason why the churches are so weak. And the amazing thing, now this is me, the amazing thing about the history of the church in this country is that we have not suffered persecution, right? That our forefathers came from a land to escape persecution. But the reason why the church is so feeble today is because there's nothing that the world sees in the church that inspires persecution. Now I think about that, and I think about that, and I realize she's talking to me. And she's talking about my walk and my commitment with God. That the world doesn't see anything in me to have persecution rise up. See, they like my gospel because it fits in with their lifestyle. I don't want that anymore. I want the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. A gospel that's able to change the world. A gospel that's able to be bigger than any political party. To be bigger than racial issues. To be bigger than culture. A gospel that brings healing peace and genuineness to the people that follow him. Is that what you want? Amen. Yeah. Amen. Alright, so the next text we're going to look at is John chapter 5 verse 19. I asked you a question that is, did Jesus have to depend on an outside source for his strength and for his victory to overcome? And let's look at John chapter 5 verse 19. Tom, do you have that? Can you read that for me? Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. What does that verse actually tell you? How much could Jesus do on his own? Yeah. That's, hard to, that's hard to comprehend. This is Jesus. This is, this is God in the flesh. But he said he could do how many things on his own? <coughs> so did Jesus understood, understand what it means to have total dependence on God? Did Jesus have to live that out? Do you ever find it strange that the scripture tells you that Jesus had to learn obedience? Why? Why did he have to learn obedience? Wouldn't you think that God in the flesh would naturally be obedient? Listen, I want you to think about this. I want you to think this through. Why did Jesus have to learn obedience? You said he wanted to. Even if he wanted to, it's obedient. Don't you think he would be naturally obedient? The question is, is when he was 100% man, that part, what kind of man was he? Was he like you and I? Yes. yes. Do we have to learn obedience? Yes. Why is that? It's because our flesh is disobedient, right? So the natural part of our flesh is disobedient to God. And so we have to learn obedience. Did Jesus have to experience life just like you and I? Yes. Mm. So that he can become our high priest who is able to secure us from every temptation and trial? How did he gain victory? T-D-O-G. Total dependence on God. How are you going to claim victory and gain victory? The same way. Total dependence on God. But listen, if you don't know Jesus Christ, then you're never going to have total dependence on Him. And the problem with us today in the church is that we draw close to Him with our lips, but sometimes our hearts are 
far from him. Now, I'm not talking about we're coming here to church Saturday and Saturday night we're at the bar. What I'm talking about is that we're called to trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. We think we're good if we can give 75% of all of us to Him. You know, that would, that would make us a super Christian. And God says, no, I want 100%. And we go, well, 80%, man, that would be fantastic. And God says, no, I want 100%. Well, God, when things are going good, and I have enough money in my bank account to pay my bills, and my kids aren't doing anything bad, then, then, then I can do that. And God says, in the midst of of the darkness and in the darkest depths of the pit you need to trust me with all of your heart and seek me with all of your mind and all of your strength I'll give you an example of this have you ever thought how God would actually work out this problem between Jacob and Esau do you know what the problem between Jacob and Esau was the problem was a family problem and the problem was is that one of them would receive the blessing. And that blessing would allow that child to have the spiritual blessing of the Messiah would come through his line. Right? Now, who was the firstborn? Esau. And the second came right after him, but who was the firstborn? So who should have gotten the birthright? But Esau, was he worthy? No. The book of Hebrews says that he was not worthy. But he was the firstborn. And not only that, but who did Isaac want to have that blessing? Esau. Esau. Who did the mother want to have that blessing? Jacob. Oh, man. Who did God want to have that blessing? Jacob. How was God going to work that out? We don't know because they didn't give him a chance. Right? So what happened? They got to the point where Isaac is at the end of his life. And he needs to give this blessing. The mother knows because she heard the angel. And the angel said that Jacob would receive the blessing. Isaac heard the same thing. But he didn't want Jacob to have the blessing. He wanted Esau to have the blessing. And if they, as told in Patriarchs and Prophets, if they would have waited, God would have worked it out the way God wanted. If they would have trusted the Lord with all of their hearts and leaned not on their own understanding, if they would have acknowledged Him, then He would have directed their paths. But what happens? You know the story? <laughs> what happens is they had a lack of faith, right? Now, wasn't that a problem with Abraham and Sarah as well? Yes. Because they waited, and they waited, and they waited, and they were waiting for God to work out His plan, and God wasn't doing anything. And it wasn't like they could go to God's house and knock on His door and say, God, what's going on today? <laughs> we have the privilege of having the Scriptures. And we read those Scriptures, and it seems like God talked to Abraham on a regular basis, like, you know, every month, every week, to find out that God talked to him made him a promise, and then you'd have 25 years, two and a half decades would go by, and God wouldn't say nothing, and God apparently wasn't doing nothing. Right? So apparently, right? Brothers and sisters, this is the hardest thing for us in our limited capacity and in this sinful flesh to trust in God when we don't see Him working. Or we don't see Him doing what we think should be done. Over and over and over again in Scripture, the Bible tells us to do what on the Lord? Wait. Now you see, in the 21st century, for me, waiting on the Lord, if I can give Him 10 minutes, i got things i got to do, people i got to annoy. <laughs> Then I said, I got, I got a little more mature. I said, okay, God, I got 30 minutes here. 30 minutes. Is that, is that good enough? Is that, I'm waiting. 
two and a half decades. And then he speaks again and gives them the same promise and makes them wait another two and a half decades. So we come down to Isaac and Rebekah. And Rebekah knows that Isaac is going to give the blessing. And he tells Esau to go out and get me venison and make me some good meat. And so he goes out and Rebekah steps right in. And she gives the plan to Jacob. And Jacob wants this blessing. But do you realize that Jacob did not want to deceive his father? But he didn't see any other way. And Rebecca didn't see any other way. Now in their heads, they had to think, God needs my help. He can't do this. Maybe he, maybe he just can't figure this out. We can figure it out. Now, how long did it take her to come up with this plan? She did it in a moment. She must be a right? cook. <laughs> she had all time to dwell. Think about this. But I want you to think about this. This is what we do. We do not trust God, and we say, well, I'll have to take care of this myself. Okay? Now, each time this has happened in Scripture, how well did the outcome work out? Did Rebecca love Jacob? Oh. Do you realize that when he had to leave, she never saw him again? And he never saw his mother in life again. <laughs> How do you think, and, and again, Patriarchs and Prophets gives you a little insight in this. When the deception took place and it happened, how do you think uh, Isaac felt? Listen, Patriarchs and Prophets tells us that he knew he was deceived, and when Esau came in for the blessing, he knew that what had taken place <coughs> eventually was God's will. The way it was done wasn't God's will, but for Jacob to have the blessing was God's will, and he knew that he couldn't turn back from that, which is why there was no more blessing for Esau. And he had to submit and realize that what he failed to do caused this rift in his family now. Because he did not trust and depend on God. So, let's look at some more text. Turn to John chapter 5, verse 30. John 5, verse 30. It says, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I can of myself do how many things? I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. So, Jesus healed the sick, cast out demons, raised the dead. How much of that did he do in his own power? None of that. Jesus had to wake up every morning and decide what he was going to do for that day. Where he was going to go. Who was he going to preach to. Did he figure that out on his own? He got that from his father. Now listen. I'm going to get up tomorrow and I know that I've got to be on a job at a certain time. And I know that after that job's done, I've got to be on another job at a certain time. In this life that we have, it is hard now to listen to God's still small voice. Now I've met people in the church who quit their job, stop supporting their family, so that they can spend the time to hear God's voice and tell them what to do every day. Is that God's will? No. So you see, you got to have a balance here, right? And that balance has to be balanced on a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. For you to have total dependence on God, means you're going to have to know who God is. Is that right? Yeah. And to know who God is, you have to know who Jesus is. Because Jesus said to Thomas, now, which one of his disciples said, Lord, show us the Father? Is it Thomas? Yeah. And Jesus said, if you have seen me, what? Yes. You have seen the Father. So if you want to know what God is like, you have to know what Jesus is like. 
You have to know Jesus. All this, brothers and sisters, hinges and is based on relationship. When I grew up in the Catholic Church, I don't ever remember, I don't ever remember anybody telling me I needed a relationship with God. What I was told is that I needed to know the priest and that I needed to go through the priest to be able to get to God. But there was a bunch of other people in between there to help mediate. And I, that, that caused a lot of confusion. But when I first started going to Protestant churches and I started to grasp and understand that you can go to God directly through Christ, and I started to read the Bible and started to know who Jesus was, then I realized how easy it is to have a relationship with Him. Because if you read the Gospels and you read how He acted, how He treated people, the fact that He gave everything He had, every day, every hour, in selfless ministry, I realized, I want to know somebody like that. I want to spend time with somebody like that. I want to become like that. Okay, so let's look at the next verse. That's going to be John 15, verses 5 and 6. John 15... John 15, verses 5 and 6. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, now listen, Jesus said that without his Father, he could do what? And so Jesus here now tells us that without him, we can do what? He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is, with, is withered. And they that gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. So here is how this works. Jesus depended fully on his Father, and Jesus overcame the world. We are called to overcome the world if we fully depend on Jesus. If we start to realize that in and of ourselves, we can do nothing. Now, what does that mean, nothing? I, without Jesus' help, unless he takes my breath away, can walk out that door, right? What does he mean, you can do nothing? Nothing good. Very good. Nothing good. If you want to live a life in harmony with God, if you want victory over the desires of the flesh, you can do nothing without Jesus Christ, right? If you want to understand spiritual things, you can do nothing without Jesus Christ. If you want to bear much fruit and be a witness and a worker for God, you can do nothing without Jesus Christ. If you want to have a legacy that will be eternal, you can do nothing without Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Okay, so the next verse we want to look at is uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Hebrews 4, 16. With Jesus Christ, we can do all things. Paul says in Philippians that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And if I'm in Christ, then we have this promise in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. What does that say? Let us therefore come... What's that next word? Boldly. Let us therefore come... <coughs> Boldly. What does that mean? Boldly. Come with confidence, without fear. And where can we come? To His throne. Now let me ask you a question. What do you think the odds are that you're going to be able to go to the White House and get to see President Obama? 
What do you think the odds are that you can go up to Tallahassee and see Governor Scott? But God has told us that in Christ, we can come boldly to His throne and stand right in front of Him. Now listen, you remember the story of... Uh, what is her name? Esther. Esther. 